Here we go. Welcome to the Wabash Center webinars. Today we are discussing organizational change, collaboration, and creativity. I am Nancy Lynn Westfield, Director of the Wabash Center. At the producer's desk is Carly Hollinsby, and of course in the sound engineer's booth is Paul Myrie. Um, to get a question to our guests today, please email Paul Myrie. His email address is myhrep at wabash.edu. Paul Myrie at myhrep at wabash.edu. In this moment of rebellion, protest, and upheaval, religious leaders must facilitate the change that is being dreamed of, that is being demanded. To help us think about this change in lasting ways, we have brought two guests, and two guests that I'm very proud to be uh, affiliated with. They are known each for their innovation, for their ability to do institu institutional and lasting change. Welcome to the show, Reverend Stephen Lewis. He is president of the Forum for Theological Exploration. Welcome, President Lewis, to the show. It's got to be with you. And also in our conversation is Reverend Matthew Wesley Williams. Matthew is president of the Interdenominational Theological Center. Welcome, President Williams. Thank you. It's good to be with you. We are mindful in this conversation that the global pandemic is still uh, upon us and likely to get worse. We are mindful that the blatant, although I'm going to use the word typical, uh, murders in the streets of men and women is being met by uh, maybe uncharacteristic rebellion that might be turning into a movement. Mm. We're also mindful in this time and in for this conversation of the economic downturn that we're coping with. And that downturn is liable to go into a national depression and maybe even international depression. So I'm, I'm just, I'm putting those things out there because this conversation is at the intersection of those three phenomena in this society. Yeah. We are turning to you, to the two of you, because you are known for developing lasting change in institutions. So let's start with the basics, right? Let's start with President Lewis. What is collaborative? creative collaboration? And why is that such an unfamiliar phrase for leaders, for theological leaders? Yeah, so when I think about creative collaboration, it really, I think about it in connection with problem solving, and particularly um, solutions towards some of the most kind of entrenched things that we face. And so um, in thinking about that, one of the things that we oftentimes say is that, you know, it's not a matter of who's the smartest person on the team or in the room, but it's the room itself. And so how do you scaffold, create the conditions where you can actually access the collective wisdom of the whole? And for, for at least for me, in my context, diversity is an important part of that because it is because it is the result of diverse perspectives that you're able to then come up with um, many more ideas in which you could have come up on your own to kind of figure out what's the best way forward. And so when I think about collaboration, collaboration is in service to accessing a broader, diverse perspective in order to address the kinds of challenges that you face. And so um, creative collaboration is that, um, not finding people who are necessarily um, think the same way that you do or even in your own industry or even within your own uh, profession. Um, you want um, a diverse enough of ideas that can help you think outside uh, your kind of normal circumstances or frameworks or for thinking in order to come up with better solutions uh, possibly to address the challenges that you face. So that's what I would say about creative uh, collaboration. So Matthew, come on into the conversation because so many uh, theological theologically trained religious leaders have been trained to work solo, yes. the Lone Ranger mentality. Yes. And here you two successful executives, and I mean that in the best way, right? The successful executives <laughs> that are making your way through this. I know it makes people laugh, but I'm, I'm not being facetious about that, are, are doing something different, right? Collaboration is not something we know. Yeah, so, um... There's a long story to uh, my collaboration with Stephen Lewis. 
<laughs> and it goes back about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> but it, I think it started with a deep dissatisfaction with um, the kind of typical ways that we've seen ourselves and other religious leaders form which was in this model that suggested that uh, expertise, certainty, and the, the individual, the intelligent individual was really all you needed <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. to facilitate the kind of change and transformation that we hope to see. And I think one of the things that we both recognized in our own journeys was that that was just an out, outright falsehood. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> we recognized that we needed one another um, we're, we're both strong where the other's not so strong. Um, and neither one of us, I think, uh, by that time we had endured sufficient uh, suffering and uh, grief uh, such that our, our egos weren't in the way. We recognized that we needed each other. And it helped to set a model, I think, for the way we think about leadership and to facilitate the development of leadership um, that in many ways is countercultural in this field, which in uh, this field is, is, is rife with models that uh, really emphasize the individual expert. We're, and we're in a mode, we're in, a, uh, uh, we're in a, a moment where we recognize that, you know, expertise has limited, uh, if any, um, usefulness in a space where nobody has been before. So pick up where Stephen left off and then we'll go back to Stephen. When I first uh, was talking to Stephen about collaboration and he used the term diversity, mm. um, I thought he meant racial ethnic diversity. Mm. And he does mean that, but he means much more than that, right? So yes. when you guys talk about collaboration, being in a room together, the room matters, um, and it's about bringing a diverse understanding of minds. To, so I think the typical listener like me would hear that word diversity and think you meant racial diversity. That's not exactly what you're talking about. No, no. That it, it's, it's what, what Stephen is talking about is a problem solving methodology, right? It, it's the basic idea that um, whereas most of our systems are set up for uh, at least a feigned meritocracy, um, if we're going to be about the business of actual problem solving, you have to have a diversity of perspectives, sight lines, worldviews that are modeling these complex issues that we're facing from very different sight lines, right? And then not only that, but you also, you also have to have the kind of um, learning and problem solving practices in place that give us access to that diverse uh, knowledge, right? And so that there's something that begins to emerge when you have um, diversity of perspectives and disciplines and types of expertise around the table, that if, if you can facilitate a space in which we gain access to the collective wisdom, um, then it's not a matter of one plus one plus one equals you know, three. It does an exponential effect to what happens in a kind of gestalt, right, in that space where we gain access to something among us that we, we just didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, that's, that's the, that's the kind of diversity of, of thought and approach and thinking and, 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 um, and, and practice, I would say, that's necessary when you're dealing with complex challenges like we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. So when academics hear uh, that description, Stephen, some, they, some will say you're talking about interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity. That's still not what you're talking about. Nope. So do do one more round, Stephen, and then we'll move on. What are guys, I think it's a difficult concept for us. What is this yeah, thing so, called collaboration? So in terms of a reference point, I would lift up uh, Scott Page, um, mm. who's a scholar, mathematician uh, out of I think University of Michigan. But he's basically, you know, kind of looking at kind of cognitive diversity. He's written a, a more recent piece around the diversity bonus, like what is the value of a diversity? And, you know, the term is marred by, you know, so much of what we've been doing in the field, beyond the field, around issues around, you know, race and equity and that type of thing or whatever. But um, what we're talking about is uh, this type of cognitive diversity which is about uh, life experiences. And I think, you know, what, what uh, 
page quips is this idea that 99.999% of the time, um, a more heterogeneous body of actors, of perspectives, will outperform a more homogeneous body of actors and perspectives when it comes up with developing um, ideas and solutions to address challenges that one faces. And so, you know, in, in that sense, um, you can have diversities in terms of, you know, black and white, Latina, X, Hispanic, Asian American, et cetera. And, but you can have all those individuals, they think like, cause they've been trained the same way. Um, they've, you know, they, they, they have been uh, formed in, in a very particular kinds of ways. But what Paige is talking about and what I'm trying to get at when I think about uh, collaboration for, or let me say diversity for collaboration's sake, is this idea about how do you get the kind of cognitive ability and diversity of perspectives and life ways and views that can shake things up. Some of this, I think you see reflective in the design world, um, IDEO and other folks who have been talking about, you know, you get scientists and you get uh, educators and you get business leaders, you get all these different uh, diversities of professionals together brings this type of uh, diverse cauldron of, of uh, intellectual kind of ability to be able to see a thing, a problem, an issue from different vantage points. And that prism allows you to hopefully see more possibilities and ideas mm -hmm. because now you're open to other perspectives and ways of looking at an issue that you know, you otherwise wouldn't be, you know, uh, likely to look at. And so it's, it's beyond interdisciplinary, but it, it can be, I mean, it can be mm -hmm. some of that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, within higher ed, um, it is a, a perfect ground to figure out how do you actually kind of curate that kind of collective diversity for the purpose of collaborating. Because if, if we don't become more collaborative, then our schools and our institutions will be in even worse dire straits. So let, let's go there, because that's, that's where I was going to go. So we have these uh, seminaries, these divinity schools, these departments of religion, colleges, university, faced in this moment with, with all that is happening in our society. We know that those of us around these scholarly tables have all been put through the same sausage grinder. We are all experts in our field. Otherwise, we would not have gained access to these chairs to this table. So it, what do we do when we don't have that diversity, but we want to, in good-hearted ways, begin to change our institutions? What do you do, Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> well, this goes, to the, this goes to the question of why interdisciplinarity is not what we're talking about. Um, because <clears throat> what typically happens, precisely because of the way scholars are typically formed, is that we come to its interdisciplinarity um, staked out in our disciplines, <laughs> right? So uh, it becomes, um, in a way, what, what happens is that we are, we're still owning, right, the kind of methodological approach and the language world of the discipline um, as our territory, right? But I'm going to be in conversation or add on <laughs> these other, these other um, kind of approaches and, 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 and methodologies and languages. Um, but do, we don't typically develop a new language in that process. There's no synergy. Right, there's no synergy. Um, what, what, and, and what's necessary in a moment like this with such destabilization is calling into the question that just the foundations of that which has formed us, right? What is the nature and purpose of education mm -hmm. itself? I right? do think so, that's being called in the question, right? You're not overstating be. that. That is being it called into question be. in this moment. It has to be. It has to be. And what that also calls for is a reckoning with the, with the question of whether we have been um, 
uh, miseducated and have to begin to lay down some sacred cows um, that have contributed to our formation to, to find another way, right? To really unearth and then begin to scrutinize those fundamental uh, assumptions that have driven you know, many of our professional lives, the reward systems that we participate in in the academy, um, and, and think about, does this actually serve the purposes for which I was called into this work in the first place? Um, you know, am I, am I really about the business of problem solving or am I just carving out intellectual territory? Um, and when it comes to the work of institutions, um, you know, there's really not much in the formative process of a scholar that prepares them to think institutionally, okay. right? So it requires moving into a different kind of mindset to be able to even ask the right questions um, of the institution that, uh, and, and of, of the, the institution's vocation and mission in the, in the world. I also think racism requires white people to be miseducated. I'm going back to your, your, <laughs> your use of the language about miseducation. Yeah. Right. Carter G. Woodson miseducation. And it's, yes. and it's attributed to how Carter first imagined it. Right. Yes. Talking about the miseducation of black folks. Right. Suppose ra a pillar of racism, which is is to miseducate white people. Suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and to rec for our institutions to reckon with the miseducation, not only of people of color, but with white people, is to rethink, the, I'm just saying what you were saying, the purpose of education. Absolutely. And not just, not just the purpose, uh, where does it happen? Yes. Who is it for? And how is it delivered? Mm -hmm. And if you're trained to be very myopic in a very particular kind of discipline, um, executives within higher ed can't afford to do that. You have to think more um, organizationally, more university-wide, more globally uh, in that kind of kind of framework. And so. What, what is the formational processes that have helped or trained or developed and build your capacity to be able to do that? I think the other piece of this too, Matthew and I talk about this all the time, is that, you know, the difference between moving from, you know, a, a researcher um, to an administrative executive role is the difference between being a plumber and an engineer. They're two vastly different kinds of professions. Right. Mm -hmm. They have a whole different kind of language world, a whole different kind of training. Um, both of them are important in any type of engineering uh, building construction aspect of it, but, but they, they serve two very different roles. And so where, where do our, edu you know, where, are, where do our executives, where do they go to be trained? And if where they go to be trained is by people who are trained in the thing that they need to be, uh, you know, um, no longer trained in, but for something for, then they had to find other ways to, to be trained. I think the other piece of this too, you talk about white folks and we talk about people of color. People of color's formation is not a photo negative of white folks in the way in which they get trained to be institutional leaders. That's exactly right. The circumstances and what we see even in this country about what people of color are having to wrestle with and navigate day in, day out require different kinds of things in terms of their formation. And then finally, I'll just say is that a large piece of this is about what is the kind of long-term vision of the institution in terms of where it's trying to go? How is it responding to a changing landscape? And then how do you lead change in the institution in order to capture that vision uh, to where you want to go from your current reality? Right. Uh, too often, we're not thinking about moving institutions towards vision. We're about maintaining what we understand to be our mission. But missions can evolve and they can change and they can grow based off of what's taking place in the landscape. So I don't think we need another strategic plan. I think we need to redesign the thing. So that's what you, you, your answer, Matthew's answer, Stephen's answer to what do we do? I hear you both talking about we need to redesign theological education. But I'm right. back to Stephen's question is who teaches our our administrators how to do design, let alone redesign. 
<laughs> I can't point to a place where that's happening for our people um, and for our institutions. Um, you know, Stephen and I cooked up a few labs here and there uh, during our time together. Uh, and in, in a real sense, I see ITC right now as one of those labs. Um, but this, this question of design, uh, let me just tell you a quick story. So um, I guess about a couple years ago, uh, I was in conversation with a, a leader of a historically black theological school. And they were in a series of conversations about um, the future of theological education and, and their school in particular. And they were hosting these conversations around this question, what does 21st century theological education need to look like, right? And they were attempting to build a strategy and, and to do design um, based on that question. And when I caught wind of it and, and th this person and I got in conversation, I said to him, wrong question, wrong question. It's not what is 21st century theological education need to look like. <laughs> right. As if it's one thing, one, yeah. one universal thing. Exactly. The question is, who do you serve? Mm -hmm. Who are your people? What do they need? What are they trying to accomplish? Right. And, and how are you situated, uniquely gifted? What do you have to offer to that? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, we've got theological schools, you know, backwards and forwards wondering why they can't enroll students. And it's because they, they, in many cases, theological schools are not thinking about who they serve, or they think that they serve the same person today that they served 20 years ago, right? So it's not just a matter of getting clear about your mission, it's a matter of getting clear about your market. Do you know who you serve? And are you designing for them and for what they need to actually accomplish in the world? Um, that's the first question of design. But if you don't see yourself in a marketplace, let's just say even in the marketplace of ideas and your commitments and accountability is to a guild right. who doesn't always love you back the way that you love it, okay. then the school can never be, and its leadership can never be fully uh, invested in what it is that its constituents need. Right. And the only way that you can do that is you got to get in, you know, you have to be in proximity to the lived experience of the people that you say you want to train um, on the ground. So you can be empathetic, you can see what they're wrestling with, but like you have to be, you have to be in close proximity to the people that you're trying to serve. And a lot of this stuff, Lynn, I mean, like, we, we're not talking, I don't think, um, you know, anything new. A lot of this stuff is what you see in kind of, you know, startup worlds, particularly folks who are doing kind of, you know, social entrepreneurship. All this stuff is about what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Who is the community that you're trying to serve? What do they need? What do they desire? What is their pain point? Um, you know, how do you know that you actually have an educational solution to address the educational problem or desire that they that they actually have is what you're developing desirable is it feasible is it something that people are requesting and need you can't do that in your school you can't do that in surveying the folks who come to your classroom you have to get out beyond the doors and you have to be talking to your constituents in the entrepreneur and social entrepreneurship world they would say you need to be talking to your customers it's all about customer discovery and what you find out is that when you, when you do that kind of listening and engaging and being in proximity to your constituents and you do that type of discovery, then you engage in a kind of human-centered kind of educational development and curriculum development. Right. Quick story, I, Matthew and I were at, a, at, a, at a, uh, one of our industry meetings and we were sitting down with, uh, you know, one executive and asked them, they were talking about how they was going through, you know, a curriculum revision. And I was saying, so how are you, how are you figuring out what changes that you need to make in a curriculum? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're doing this and that and the other, you know, we, we do kind of, you know, interviews from our students, et cetera. I said, how many of you all spending time in congregations, in communities, in places where your different constituents are? And how, do, how many of you stay there long enough 
to be able to discover what are the real kind of educational formational needs that those constituents have and how do you allow those constituents teach you what it is that you should be redeveloping your curriculum around they didn't have very much to say and so i think you know what when matthew's point about redesign it it really is about being in closer proximity to the people that you're actually trying to do education with so so, can i can i interject yeah. here just to please to, to put a finer point on this question of accountability um in in the disability advocacy world they, they, they use this term or use this phrase nothing about us without us right and um Stephen raised the question really of the reward system of the academy, right? And I think at some point, you know, even an institution like ITC has to answer the question, is our primary point of accountability the guild and the, the reward system set up within these, you know, societies and guilds that are really all about these very, very symbolic reward system. Folks aren't even getting paid, <laughs> right? Or is, is, our, is our primary accountability to the question of impact in, in the communities that are actually sending students our way, right? And so, so are, we, are we designing in ways that actually are preparing people to, to, um, to make the kind of impact in the communities that they end up going out to serve? Uh, I'll say this, this quickly. Um, I was told uh, of a study that was done commissioned by Charles Shelby Rooks back in, I think, 1971. Mm -hmm. um, he commissioned McKinley Young, the late Bishop McKinley Young. He was a, a graduate student at the University of Chicago at the time. Jeremiah Wright, who was also a graduate student at UFC, and Homer Ashby to do a, um, a study of pastors on the south side of Chicago. Uh, primary question was to what extent, and these are, these are uh, seminary educated pastors, to what extent did theological education prepare you to do ministry in the black community? To a person, the answer was not at all, right? That's been the open secret of theological education. It does not prepare people for ministry and leadership. It prepares people to think theologically right? It prepares people at their best, right? <laughs> hopefully. It prepares people to, to hopefully, you know, um, be, you know, good speakers, you know, rhetoricians, what have you, hopefully. Um, but in terms of the stuff of impactful ministry on the ground, um, I think, especially in, um, in Black communities, I think there's been a, a long-standing open secret that it does not prepare us uh, for the work that we find ourselves doing when we leave those hallowed halls. So I think that um, one of the, the practical places that I hear this conversation impacting for me would be in faculty hires. That so many of our faculty colleagues would say, <clears throat> excuse me, the use of this vocabulary and those kinds of questions is either uncouth or I'm unprepared to do this work. I was not trained to do this, or this is not scholarship. So don't bother me with that kind of thing. That's for field education. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's how it shows up. So until we, not until, because I think it's gonna be a both and, right. right? Until we help willing faculty to retool toward these kinds of critical questions, these are not, mm -hmm. The kinds of questions you're asking about teaching the people in our classrooms, not the people who used to be in our classrooms or we wish were in our classrooms or supposed to be in our classrooms, right? Teaching the available pools of people who are looking for seminary, which are primarily non-denominational, beyond denominational, trans-denominational people or recent immigrant populations, which most white seminaries are not prepared for. Matthew, you don't have that problem, which most seminaries are not prepared for those available pools of people we're, um, we're at a stalemate, right? You, you, you've got good-hearted people who don't, can't, won't. So that brings me to my next question. What are the competencies then of, of institutional creativity? Mm. If somebody said, okay, I'm going to set out to do this thing, right? We are, on, we are at a critical juncture. What competencies do I need to have or gather around me? 
And I think more, more importantly in this collaboration conversation, what competencies do I need to gather around me? Yeah. So the first one that comes up for me is in sharp distinction to that, that faculty members formation um, that you named. So it's a competency around how you generate knowledge with community, right? Um, not how you become the custodian of a body of knowledge, right? But how do you generate knowledge in community, right? So if, if we're going, so at, at ITC, we talk about our educational aim as uh, preparing prophetic problem solvers, right? What that requires is um, for both the, 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 the learner, um, but then also the, the, the professor or, or you know, learning facilitator um, to be in a mode where they, there's a kind of humility approaching the learning enterprise and they operate certainly with some salient knowledge of a particular discipline or domain, but what they really operate with is with the awareness of how to synthesize um, uh, knowledges, how to um, build relatedness among people, among ideas, um, how, to, how to operate at the level of the molecular bond rather than at the level of the atom, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, I think that's one competency. It's, it's the facilitative kind of sensibility and skill to be able to draw connections between what may be disparate uh, elements. Um, and it, I think paired with that is a, uh, a competency around systems consciousness or systems awareness. Um, so that, uh, again, with looking at complexity uh, in these institutions and the broader communities that they serve, you know, institutions, churches, organizations are living organisms, right? They're not factories, right? And, and, and it, it requires us to be able to see, um, have some awareness of the ways in which uh, one part of the system is interdependent with other, another part of the system. And it also has, has uh, all systems are born of underlying assumptions um, that give rise to the, the, to the design of the system as it is. And so for, for any system to be able to adapt to a moment like this, it has to always be in touch with its underlying assumptions. So there needs to be some skill um, and competency around um, uh, the kind of uh, collective reflective work that is always raising up for us our shared assumptions, right? That we can continue to kind of check the congruence between our shared assumptions and the world that we're living in. Are we, are we still on Mars or, <laughs> or have we moved to Saturn? Um, and will our shared assumptions give us any grounding here, right? Um, so those, those are a couple of things. The systems awareness, both at the, at the visible and invisible level, as well as the facilitative skill to be able to draw synergies and connections between similarly and disparate uh, elements. Steve. And I, I guess what I would say is that I would think about this in um, maybe kind of two different ways. So I think, you know, a person, well, let me say this. I, I guess when I think about competencies, I'm thinking about people who are in administrative and executive roles. I think, you know, People who are going to be educators, you need them to kind of be trained in the ways that they are currently trained. But for those who are going to be executives, they need to be able to think more um, like an organizational psychologist in kind of educational settings. They need to understand um, organizations have behaviors, and those behaviors are very much uh, interlocutors to the people and the dynamics of culture. Um, so they need to be a student of culture, um, not just in terms of um, the reactions in culture, but the patterns in culture, the assumptions that are behind culture and the mental models and the deeply held assumptions that oftentimes go unexamined, but they're the reasons why we do what we do in our culture. It's about 
people who are able to kind of excavate their policies and procedures and understand uh, why the institution functions the way that it functions. Um, why does it do what it does, you know, why does it do what it does? And also understanding that even after you make changes or whatever, there are ghosts within your organizational culture that sometimes that senior scholar or that, you know, person who was an intellectual ancestor within the institution has long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, the ramifications of the effect is still much inculcated within the culture, within the institution. So they have to be a student of organizational culture because we know that, you know, um, our best laid plans can be undermined by the culture um, of an institution. So they have to be able to really understand kind of organizational behavior. The other thing, too, is also understanding how educational systems are put together. So if you're in a larger university setting, you got to be able to understand the relationships and the dynamics of your particular school um, embedded in a larger university system and the ways in which you have cost centers and, and you know, you have debits and credits and accountability and all those kinds of things, the ways in which the finance department you know, works with the larger university kind of disbursement uh, department communication, which you're able to do as a leader who's a spokesman for the institution versus you, an individual thinking that you're speaking on behalf of yourself. You're not that when you're in an executive kind of role. And then I think they're the more kind of mundane kind of things as it relates to, you know, how do you read and how do you read and interpreting financial statements? What are the kind of core, um, you know, what are the core kind of uh, formulate things that you need to think about in terms of, you know, long term debt, debt to equity, all those kinds of things and trying to understand the financial picture of your educational institution. What's the runway? What does it cost in order to actually, what does it cost to be able to educate, you know, one student? Right. And what happens if you don't have, what are the contingency plans? What are the, you know, thinking about then the kind of liability in the kind of risk management aspects of an educational system um, and those kinds of things. And then I think you have to then begin think about kind of like the, the more kind of um, relational components of what it means to be an executive, not yeah. just relationships with donors, but if you're gonna lead change, you gotta lead change with the people that you have in your own respective institutions. And so how do you do the type of backdoor kind of conversations that, that, we've, that we've learned, whether it be in organizing or working in churches, that you got to have the conversation before the conversation before the conversation, mm -hmm. and also make sure you empower other folks to say the things that you could not say, that you otherwise would want to say, but you know that for the betterment of the institution, you need other people to say that. And then finally, I would say, there's a whole host of things that you got to learn as it relates to working with a board whether that be an advisory board or that be a governance board. Like what is real board governance? Because too often what I see is boards that are way too involved in the weeds and not, uh, and not kind of strategically engaged and operationally distant. And what I too see too less of is, is executives not recognizing their role as a uh, choreographing, the kind of relationships and conversations that have to take place between the board and uh, themselves to either one cover, uh, you know, the, the, their tracks in terms of what they're trying to actually do or try to solicit the board to kind of break down and help them see what they can't see as it relates to, the, to their work. But part of that then also is thinking about, you gotta think about who are the people that you have around your board table they can really be the really good kind of strategic thinkers around that. And most of us just are not, I mean, that's not what we're trained to do. We're not trained to do those kinds of things. And so um, as best as we can, you know, we do the best that we can. And, and I think what Matthew and I have been saying and, and kind of screaming, you know, to the top of lungs for a long time is that <laughs> there is another way to do this. Right. And there are people that can help you. And, you know, we, we need to be more open to that. But it's a whole host of things because you're talking about the difference between an engineer and a plumber. Right. So I think well, that it, your, so, the, the yeah. two of you list of competencies to me could be used in an autopsy for many of these institutions that are dying right. or have died. 
to say where, what, what killed it. Mm -hmm. your, list of, your combined list of competencies could say, oh, they didn't do that, they didn't do that, they didn't do that, and they didn't do that. You can actually kill institutions. There, there's one more. Mm, keep going. Um, that I think is important. And it, it's, a, it's, it's an affective competency. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you, can have, you can be as, as uh, technically skilled as you want to. You could have read as many books on organizational change and behavior um, as you can stand. But at the end of the day, if you can't, if you can't handle the unknown, mm -hmm. if you can't reckon with mystery and uncertainty and being blindsided by stuff on a daily basis that you had no, no preparation for um, and still sustain a level of kind of anchored presence um, to provide um, a non-anxious space for the people who are working with you and you're working with, if you can't regulate your own nervous system in the face of upheaval, that will, that will beyond all of the, all of the technical uh, and cognitive kind of competencies we've talked about, that'll kill it all up all by itself. So, Matthew, that brings us to this moment of uncertainty. Lee, can I just say one quick one? Please, thing? yes. <laughs> Go right ahead. Go ahead. And then Paul will come to you. Go ahead. I can't underscore what Matthew just said. Too often, I mean, even the things that we name, primarily because we know, you know, our listeners and what they're looking for. But too often the competencies of leadership are about results. So what are the type of competencies that get us the results? Then there's the kind of leadership about the how to's, how do we do X, Y, Z? But we never deal with the leadership competencies that actually ground us in source, ground us in the source of our inspiration, ground us in the source of our resiliency, ground us in the source of our own um, as Matthew said, a non-anxious presence. And if you, if you can't cultivate your inner life and to be able to slow down and not be responsive to every fire, every whim of so-and-so said this or did you hear this and that and the other, if, if, like, if, if you can't do the, the, the type of inner work which is a core competency and a resource that we have, then, um, you know, you'll be tossed to and fro for the next, you know, wave that comes through the institution or whatever. So I think there is this, this idea of, you know, the, 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 the one of the most core important competencies that you can cultivate is to be able to cultivate your inner life. But as a, as a colleague of ours said it this way, he was quoting a banker, um, he says, you know, the quality of uh, the quality of one's interior life shapes the way in which they engage in the exterior life. And if you can't, you know, they're, they're, they're inextricably tied. The ways in which you engage in the world are inextricably tied to the ways in which you are cultivating and attending to your own interior life. And so I think that's that's the core part of all the, um, what we're talking about here. Yep. So I hear you both emphasizing this, particularly in this moment of pandemic right. and uncertainty, uncertainty, particularly in this moment of protest and rebellion and uncertainty, mm -hmm. particularly in this moment of economic upheaval and uncertainty. One of the things we don't have right now, whoever the we is, is certainty about the future. That's we right. can't see around these corners or over these hills. We don't know what's going to happen. Even if we say we're going to have, no, we don't know what's going to happen. And institutions are challenged now more than ever to say, we don't know and we are uncertain. Yeah. Paul, we're ready, ready for our questions from our listeners. Uh, thank you. This has been excellent listening to uh, the conversation. Here's a question. Um, I think that resonates with where you were just now. Um, 
Can you say more about the nature and purpose of theological education at this moment? And I think I would add with that, this place of cognitive diversity, how do you form that among students? And what are the great obstacles for that development of cognitive diversity? Hmm. Well, I, I, wanna, I wanna attempt to um, speak to the, the nature and purpose of the whole enterprise of theological education. Um, I won't attempt to do that. I think any attempt to do that is probably just bound for insufficiency. <laughs> um, what I will speak to is how we articulate that at ITC and um, how we've begun, I would say, to articulate that at ITC. And for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inverse um, to Carter G. Woodson's notion of miseducation, which essentially is about, you know, as Carter G. Woodson says, if you have um, gone through a course of study and mastered a body of knowledge, but you can't solve a problem to save your life, um, you know, you've been miseducated. If you can't address the perennial problems that are facing the communities from which you come, you've been miseducated. And so, you know, what we say is that education is the process by which a community builds its capacity to solve its problems and co-create its future, right? So yeah, education, I'm gonna say it again. Education is the process by which a community builds its capacity to solve its problems and co-create its future, which suggests that theological education or any other education does not start and stop with admission into a theological school, right? Um, there's a long arc of theological education to which theological schools are accountable and, and connected. Um, but theological education within that broader enterprise of education, and I'm speaking specifically for black folks now, has a role to play in fomenting a revolution in what Miles Jones called um, uh, <laughs> our self understanding in relationship to the eternal, right? And it, it, it is, it is uh, it's not just the mastery of, body, mastery of a body of knowledge, it's the process by which you become a particular kind of person in the world in mm -hmm. relationship to other persons, right? Um, so that, that, that for me is the work of theological education and theological schools have a part to play, but not the whole to play in that process. Stephen, did you want a piece of that question? No, I, I just answered the second part of this question, which is about the kind of um, cognitive diversity. Um, I would just say that I think there's a lot of different ways to develop that in people. But first and foremost, what I would say is that it's already present. Like cognitive diversity is embodied um, in each of us. And so the, the task, I think, of the educator is to figure out how do you create the container um, to how do you create the container and the kind of pedagogical kind of approach to be able to access that and work with that um, and to see that kind of um, kind of epistemic, you know, kind of epistemology as something to put in conversation and relationship with uh, the disciplines and what they know, you know, through their particular disciplines. What are the what are the um, the downsides of that? Well, I mean, I think that the downsides of uh, cognitive cognitive diversity. I'm not sure what they all entail or whatever, but I think it is um, the degree that we um, are certain about all matters of things, or that we somehow um, have it figured out because of what it is that we know. And what we know is, is more than what we can, what we can cognitively think about. Um, and, and I think that's part of uh, the concern, at least my concern within the Guild, is that it oftentimes um, lifts up one kind of way of knowing over and above uh, all others. And I think that's one of the, you know, the failures of modernity. I think there are a lot of ancient ways of knowing uh, that particularly people of color are bringing into the academy that oftentimes get left at the, um, 
you know, gets left at the door. And I think there's more that can be said on that. It's very difficult for us as uh, white Western male institutions to challenge and move away from universality of all things, essentializing yes. all things. Yes. So part of the issues of diversity that you're talking about is there is no one leader, one answer, there is no one anything for our problems, right? How, right. So, how, how it's solved at ITC is not, will not be how it's solved in any other school. Right. And rightfully so. You just right. can't take one solution and inflict it upon all the people. However, we've all right. survived multiple variations of having stuff inflicted upon us and then held accountable for making that infliction work. Yeah. yeah and it's the well, lasting effect of industrialization. Or, Apart to, to the, the second question around how you cultivate um, that cognitive diversity, I think has a lot to do with our, our educational models. And so this question about where is knowledge being generated, right, um, and, and who gets to do it um, is, is key here. So, you know, if, again, this is, this is going to, to where ITC is and is going, if we think about the classroom, the, the, the campus that's envisioned behind me in this background, not as the container of learning, but as a staging ground for learning, such that uh, the folks who are coming through our institution are actually being taught, not just by professors who come through seven years of a PhD program, but they're, if they're studying, uh, let, let's say, the, 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 the problem, the prophetic, the, the problem that they're preparing to be able to address in ministry and leadership has something to do with food sovereignty, sustainability, and systems, right? Then one of their teachers has to be black farmers, right? One of their teachers has to be somebody who manages uh, some part of the supply chain for uh, some, it has to be, um, they have to have a, a, a host of, 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 uh, of, of mentors and teachers who themselves are in conversation with one another, right? The farmer may not have ever been to a graduate school or may have, right? Um, but that professor probably ain't never been on the farm. And there's some things that they have to, to share and teach one another um, while they're in the process of facilitating the development of this, this leader who's trying to learn something around the, you know, how food systems might be the, the, the mission that a particular congregation or denominational body takes on in service to the, the well-being of the communities that they serve that are typically in food deserts, right? That's a kind of concrete example that that cognitive diversity is facilitated by people being set down in different types of environments and building a wider swath of, of networks, relationships, teachers, and learners um, that they're in conversation with. And that, and that uh, the mechanics of that conversation is also modeling for the student that when they get out into ministry after their degree, they continue to build networks based on whatever problems they're solving with their own people for the time and the context that they're in. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one of the things, uh, just very quickly, I was talking to a, a dean at the, uh, listen to a dean at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Engineer, and one of the things that the, he and others were talking about is reimagining a 21st century university. And part of the question is, so where is the university in the 21st century? And what they were saying is that it's not the school, but it's the city itself, that people are coming to school um, as part of their ongoing continuing education but they're not going to school to go find a job. And I think for women who are particularly matriculating through theological education, um, and particularly uh, women of color and black women in particular, they either have to go on to do PhD work, if that's what they feel called to do and become educators, or they come out of a program and they got to figure out, you know, what else are they going to do? But that's part of their continuing education because they know when they leave theological education, they may or may not be able to find a job depending on their particular, um, you know, their particular tradition. So I say all that to say is that the, the site of where education happened is no longer limited to 
face to face or even in the classroom. And in fact, education, particularly with and among communities of color, have always take, taken place beyond the classroom. Right. Uh, that we would consider to be the, the university, oftentimes because we didn't have access or we didn't have the means in order to get there. And that's not to say that, you know, people shouldn't uh, do that, but just to recognize that the site of education has changed. And I think COVID will even continue to push those boundaries. So then how then do you actually develop the type of cognitive kind of knowing in, in educational background that allows you to solve problems if the city um, becomes your university. That's it. What you just described is an African notion of community and education versus a European notion of community and education. And, and, that the, and the notion of community is not you are extracted from the community yes. to go and study and become somebody differently than that has no no interest in the community, that your curiosities and your learning are the responsibility of all people in the community and to the benefit of all people in the community. Yeah. So in many regards, we're returning out of necessity to ancient ways that are not European ways. Absolutely. Uh, our time is winding down. Um, some, one of you tell us about another way, living and leadership change in purpose. Yeah, so I mean, it, it really is a set of disciplines uh, that we, another way, let me say this way, is that it grows- I should say, up, another way is, a, is their book, right? Let's get that out. <laughs> another <laughs> way, <laughs> Living and Leading Change on Purpose is a book that Matthew, myself, and uh, Dr. Dory Baker uh, co co-authored. And it really comes out of um, our kind of deep satisfaction that you know that the status quo is the only way um and recognizing that even in the midst of american imperialism that we will always need alternatives uh, we will always need fugitive spaces uh, to demonstrate you know an alternative way of being because oftentimes we know that you know um the boy says that you know a system cannot fail those that it was never meant to protect and so part of what we're thinking about is like, how do you create the kind of alternative spaces to kind of s systems that don't allow for our human flourishing? And so in that book, we kind of chronicle kind of four, what I would call kind of community disciplines um, that people will kind of work and grow into and exercise that muscle around in order to help the community discern its collective work the soul that is, you know, the work that his soul must do collectively. But we also will find individually our own particular uh, sense of call and purpose in that larger community. And to do that assumes that there's a particular kind of leadership that Matthew writes so beautiful about in chapter six around liberating leadership. Matthew, you want to share a little bit about what we're up to there? Yeah, sure. So this chapter six is... Um, our attempt to talk about the kind of leadership model that's that's um, that our that that another way is attempting to help to cultivate and to to put a, another point on what Stephen was sharing is that those four disciplines um, we call the care practices. They stand for creating hospitable space, asking self awakening questions, reflecting theologically together, and there we're talking about critical theological reflection. Uh, and enacting our next most faithful steps. Those four disciplines that you don't get all at once, you practice, begins to cultivate a different kind of environment, an alternative space in which we, um, which really become a portal for um, another way of being in the world. And so liberating leadership is, is our attempt to kind of unpack um, the, the, the destructive, I think some toxic, toxic, but seemingly noble models of leadership that we've been socialized into um, for uh, another mode of leadership that we call, call we, we talk about it as moving from the warrior hero to the warrior healer. Um, and, uh, you know, moving out from this notion of the leader, the leader as this out front figure, 
um, to the leader as more or to leadership as the quality of a community that finds its way into individual kind of senses of purpose. But it, it, it shows up as facilitation, as choreography, as giving the body, giving the community more access to its own inherent value and knowledge. Um, and so liberating leadership is about the leadership that liberates, but it's also about liberating ourselves from conventional notions of leadership that have held us bound and really undermined some of our more liberative and freedom seeking movements. Reverend Stephen Lewis, President of the Forum for Theological Exploration, and Reverend Matthew Wesley Williams, President of the ITC, I want to thank you for this um, redemptive conversation, right? Mm. This important conversation that we are a community of people, a community of scholars who are struggling in this moment um, and redesign, collaboration, creativity um, is what we need. So thank you for giving us um, these insights in, in this critical moment. Um, I want to remind our listeners um, and our viewers that uh, the webinar will be uploaded onto our website, both in podcast form as well as webinar form. Um, probably we do it like a 48 hour turnaround. So the information is available for you to listen to and to disperse into your own networks. And of course, I'd like to thank Carly and Paul, my staff for being so diligent in these moments. Thank you for this important conversation. Thank you. And we're out. What a terrific conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Great to, great to be in this conversation.